in chapter 1 that I'd like to start in is verse number 18 where the Bible reads, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. And the title of my sermon this morning is, Unto us which are saved. Amen. Unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Now if you would flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you're already in chapter 1 there. And while you're turning there, I'll read for you another similar verse to the one we just saw. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God Amen. unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So in 1 Corinthians 1.18, it said that the preaching of the cross is unto us which are saved, the power of God. Then Romans 1.16 said that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Now let's look at a definition of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. The Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So according to the Bible here, the gospel, the good news, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And He says, you are saved by the gospel. It's His death, burial, and resurrection that saves you. And he says, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Now you say, well, how could someone believe in vain? How could someone believe and it does not benefit them whatsoever? It's simple. They believe the wrong thing. Right. Amen. Believing in vain means you believe something other than the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Right. So it wouldn't make any sense if somebody could believe the, the gospel and it be in vain. No, no, no. They don't even know the gospel. That's why he's saying they have believed in vain if they don't believe in the resurrection of Christ. Why? Because in this chapter later on, he's going to talk about the fact that there are people at that church who were denying the resurrection. Right. Those are the people that believed in vain. The Jehovah's false witnesses today have believed in vain. Yeah, you know, it's so amazing to me how the Jehovah's Witnesses go door to door more than any other time of year in the two to three weeks leading up to Easter. Who got a visit from the, the Jehovah's Witnesses in the last few weeks? And the ironic thing about it is that they have their biggest service for Easter and they don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, go figure. They have believed in vain this morning. But unto us which are saved, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection is the power of God unto salvation. Now, first of all, we're going to come back to 1 Corinthians 15. But number one, the first point out of three this morning is that the resurrection is the power of God unto us which are saved. Now, look at 1 Peter chapter number one. Go to 1 Peter chapter number one. And while you're turning to 1 Peter 1, I'll read for you from Romans 5. The Bible says in verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, watch this, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. So just as much as we're saved by his death on the cross, we're also saved by his resurrection. It's all part of the package there of the gospel. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again, which is similar to the term born again that's found in several places throughout Scripture, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we're born again or begotten again by the resurrection. It's what saves us. The Bible says in verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith. Amen. Not kept by works. Oh, we're kept saved. No, we're kept saved by faith. Amen. You're not kept saved by what you do. You're kept saved by what he did. Amen. 
You're kept by the power of God. And you know what the power of God is? The gospel. Amen. The death, burial, and resurrection. We're not saved by our works. We're saved by faith in the gospel. He says, we're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, unto us which are saved, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. That's why when we preach the gospel, we emphasize the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But you'll notice that when people preach a false gospel, that's not what they emphasize. That's not the power of God to them. To them, the power of God is turning over a new leaf in their life. I mean, you hear these people teach a gospel of, you know, reforming yourself. And if you'll just repent of your sins is the buzzword that they right. use. Just repent of your sin. Just turn from sin and you'll be saved. And they go on and on about how these people need to turn from their sins. And they say, oh, but God's going to give them the repentance. But here's the thing. The power of God to salvation is not the power for you to turn away from your sins so you can be saved. No, the power of God unto salvation is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And it's faith in that that saves you. Amen. Not your deeds, not your works, not your ability to turn over a new leaf. Now, of course, God knows that we all need to turn over a new leaf in our lives. And we all need to repent of our sins on a continual basis. But that's not the power of God unto salvation. That has nothing to do with salvation. That has to do with sanctification. That has to do with our walk with God. That has to do with our relationship with God. But it doesn't have anything to do with our salvation. The resurrection is the power of God unto us which are saved. People that are saved know that it's all about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's all about Him getting the glory for our salvation. And the Bible says that no flesh should glory in His presence. You know, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that was said in the context of people glorying in keeping the law or glorying in being circumcised, or glorying in, in being a part of this church or that church or following this preacher or that preacher. No, God forbid that we should glory in anything but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ Amen. when it comes to salvation. That's the only power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Amen. Get off this repent of your sins stupidity right. for salvation. Get off this stupid lordship salvation. Yeah. It's nonsense. Amen. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Amen. Give him the glory. We are sinners. We don't deserve salvation. The only power we have to be saved is just by putting our faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. To us which are saved, it's the power of God. But the Bible says, to those that perish, it's foolishness. Now, there are different types of people who perish because there are those, of course, who claim the name of Christ, but they still don't get it. They don't believe the gospel. They're seeking it by their works and by their deeds. And to these people, it seems foolish to them when you tell them, hey, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's foolishness unto them. They say, what in the world? You mean to tell me that you can live however you want? They think it's dumb. But the Bible says, no, it's the power of God. Amen. It's the wisdom of this world that's dumb. Amen. It's dumb to think that you're good enough to go to heaven when you right. sin every day. Yeah. It's dumb to think that you can offer God a filthy rag and that that's going to purchase your way into heaven when the Bible says that we're redeemed by the incorruptible blood of Jesus Christ, the right. Lamb of God, Amen. which taketh away the sin of the world. Right. It's kind of dumb to then take your puny righteousness and works and offer that to God as a ransom for your soul. That's dumb. It'd be just as dumb is if you committed all kinds of crimes and you went to uh, the courthouse in Phoenix today and they're just reading off all these charges against you, all these felonies, and it's like guilty, 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 guilty. And then you get to the sentencing hearing. The sentencing. And they say, you know, Stephen L. Anderson, do you have anything to say to you for yourself? You know, why we should relax the sentence? And I got up and said, well, whoa, I go to church every week. You know, I'm given to the poor. I, I read my Bible. I pray. They'd say, that's not relevant. They'd say, you've broken all these laws. You've hurt all these people. You've done all this damage. You must be punished. It's foolish, but thank God Christ Jesus took our punishment for us. That's the power 
of the gospel right there. The substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. It's available to all. But then there's another type of, of person who perishes. And this is the person who doesn't even claim the name of Christ. The person who just rejects the, the Bible out of hand. And today in the United States of America, this segment of the population is growing every day. People who are atheists or agnostics. Our country is, of course, being de-Christianized right. over the past few decades. And so now you have this growing segment of the population that scoffs at the Bible. And they mock the Bible. Why would they mock the Bible? Because it's foolishness unto them. I mean, why would it surprise us that they make fun of and mock the gospel of Jesus Christ when the Bible already told us thousands of years ago that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And they, they can't wrap their mind around it. They look, well, why in the world would he have to die on the cross? Why did he do that? You know, why, why would he have to die and, and raise again? It just doesn't make any sense. You know, I just heard that there's a worldly movie that just came out, like some kind of a Hollywood movie about the resurrection of Christ. So I went online and just read the, the synopsis of it. I think it's called Risen. Did anybody hear this one? Yeah. So I looked at the synopsis of it online, and here's what they said. They said, this is a movie about the resurrection of Jesus Christ through the eyes of an unbeliever. And I'm thinking to myself, it's going to lack all understanding. You know, that talk about the blind leading the blind. And, it's, uh, and it kept saying, Yeshua, Yeshua. And I was like, that's all I need to know about this movie. His name's Jesus. Amen. It's not Yeshua. It's Jesus. Right. But anyway, they, you know, it's like, oh, you know, he's like uh, some kind of an investigator. Some Roman uh, centurion has sent him to go and figure out, you know, about this rumor about Jesus rising from the dead. I'll use his, his correct name. And, uh, we're, you know, there he's going to go find him. And I guess, you know, according to the summary that I read, obviously I'm not going to go watch it, but I'm saying on the summary I read, it, it, it said that at the end of the movie, he sees Jesus, you know, having risen and he sees him ascend up to heaven. And then, you know, he goes away and ponders, you know, what he's seen versus what he knows to be true about the world that he lives in. Yeah, because I mean, we all know, I mean, we all know that there's no God, right? I mean, science has already proven that. I mean, you know, Lawrence, I mean, Lawrence Krauss down here at ASU has already written a book called A Universe from Nothing. And he's already demonstrated how the entire universe came from nothing. You know, and he's it's so amazing, you know, and the universe created itself from nothing. You know, and, 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 and this is what they all believe now. It's, it's real exciting, folks. It's this cutting edge new discovery where how the universe came from nothing. This is new. I'm not kidding. Stop laughing, all right? Not kidding right now. A hundred years ago, they came out with the Big Bang, okay? That's been around for a while. But I'm telling you, this is the new thing. Just in the last, I was just kidding about not laughing. But anyway, you can laugh a little bit. It is stupid. <laughs> anyway, you know, literally, like in the last 10 to 20 years, this is their groundbreaking discovery that the universe actually came from nothing. And they found the math to prove it now, okay? And so, you know, Lawrence Krauss was asked, you know, well, how can the universe come from nothing? And he said, well, the reason the universe can come from nothing is because it turns out that if you add up all the universe is energy, all the energy in the whole universe, it turns out it's zero. <laughs> it adds up to zero. I'm not kidding. I'm working on a little, uh, a little presentation where I put together all these quotes. You, you guys are going to like it. But he said, it turns out all the energy in the universe is zero. And then, you know, Michio Kaku, he said, universes are free. They're a free lunch. That's literally what he said. It turns out they just come from nothing. They create themselves from nothing. It doesn't take any energy to, to, to create a universe. The, all the energy in the universe adds up to zero. <laughs> but, 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 hey, but the gospel's, but the gospel's stupid. But the gospel's foolish, right? But any rational, scientific person would believe that the universe created itself from nothing. Okay, but this is what's out there, folks. This is what the world teaches. So that's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, where we started, it said, 
the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. See, when, when God listens to Lawrence Krauss and these atheists and everything, it sounds foolish. But here's the thing, when we preach the word of God, it sounds foolish unto the atheists. That's what the Bible said. Now go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The resurrection is the power of God unto us which are saved. To us, the story of Jesus Christ, God becoming flesh and dwelling among us, being born as a baby, living a perfect, sinful, sinless life, going around doing good, performing miracles, and preaching the word of God, dying on the cross for our sins, being buried and rising again three days later is the greatest story ever told. Amen. That's what we believe. But to the world, they scoff at it. It's foolish unto them. They look at it as some kind of a demented, twisted, it doesn't, you know, what kind of a loving God? But we look at it and say, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Amen. Right. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. They look at it and say, that doesn't even make sense. I'm going to go back to science class and learn about, you know, all these parallel universes and other galaxies that came from nothing. But number two, the resurrection is a sign unto us which are saved. So number one, the resurrection is the power of God unto us which are saved. But number two, the resurrection is a sign unto us which are saved. What does that mean? It's a sign unto us. It's, it's a miracle. And it's something that we would look at to authenticate who Jesus said that he was. The fact that he rose again from the dead authenticates who he was. Now notice the key operative phrase in this point. The resurrection is a sign unto us which are saved. Right. Now this is a key point in scripture. Because the Bible tells us, let's keep reading here in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 1, <clears throat> verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? He's down at, you know, ASU. Um, saying that the world came from nothing. Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So what does God use to save those who will believe? He uses preaching. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's the preaching of God's word. And the Bible says here, that it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them the belief, for the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So you see from this scripture that the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. We preach neither. We preach Christ crucified. Now, wisdom there is referring to logic and rationale on a human level. Man's logic, man's rationale, man's wisdom. And it's interesting because this is one of the most out of context verses that you'll hear thrown around in verse 22 where it says, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. I've heard this verse quoted in isolation more times than I can count, where they'll say this, well, the Jews require a sign. That's why they're not getting saved. Like, like it's an excuse why they're not saved. Like that somehow excuses them not being saved. And then here's what they say. But when Christ returns and he comes in the clouds and they see him, then they're going to believe because they require a sign. You know, so when they see him, they're going to believe. Sort of like when they blasphemed and mocked him as he hung on the cross saying, hey, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross and then we'll believe. So do you really think that according to everything that the New Testament teaches, Jesus Christ is going to humor these unbelieving, scoffing, Christ-rejecting Jews by then giving them what they want? Oh, you guys want a sign? Okay, here's your sign. No, here's what he said. A wicked and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Let me ask you something. 
What's the one sign that he said would be given them? The sign of Jesus and his resurrection, his right. death, burial, and resurrection. But you want to know what's funny about that? He didn't allow any of them to see that. None of them were allowed to see that. And I'm going to prove that to you. You see, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Right. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, Amen. and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So it boggles the mind how someone can quote this verse to prop up their weird end times belief about how all the Jews are going to get saved when they see Jesus coming in the clouds, when right here they have this, well, the Jews require a sign, you know, and they're going to get it. But here's the thing. What's the next verse say? The Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. He didn't say, so let's give them what they want. He didn't say, well, the Jews require a sign, so let's show them signs. Well, the Greeks require wisdom, so let's set up a think tank on how we can rationalize and logic with atheists. No, he said, preach the cross. Amen. Preach Jesus. Preach the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block. Nuts to them. Unto the Greeks, foolishness. Nuts to them. <laughs> unto us, which are saved. Unto them, which are called, both Jews and Greeks. Christ, the power of God Amen. and the wisdom of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, the Bible says. But if you would, flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. The resurrection is a sign unto us which are saved. I'm going to show you a lot of scriptures to prove that in a moment. But first, let's glance at 1 Corinthians 2 while we're there. Verse 9, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Look at verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. See, through faith we understand. The world scoffs at that. They want evidence. But faith is the evidence of things not seen, the Bible says. They don't understand that, and they will perish as a result. Now, the Bible teaches that the resurrection is a sign unto us which are saved. Go to Acts 10. I think Acts 10 is the best scripture that illustrates how it was a sign unto them that are saved. Okay. While you're turning there, I'll read for you from Romans chapter 1, where the Bible talks about the resurrection authenticating Christ and his ministry. It says in Romans 1, 3, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So the Bible says he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. That's what showed him to truly be the Son of God. Now, look, if you would, there in Acts chapter 10. Because you have to understand that when Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, he was seen of many eyewitnesses, right? The Bible says he was seen of many eyewitnesses. And in fact, you say there in Acts 10, I'll read for you from 1 Corinthians 15. It says in verse 4 that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas. Okay, Cephas is Peter. He's already saved, right? And then it says, then of the twelve. Obviously, Judas was dead, but it was the other that were left. And were they saved? Yeah, they're saved. They're believers. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. Now, these guys weren't all physical brothers. He says, he was seen of over 500 brethren at once. Brethren is the word the Bible often uses talking about Christians, talking about those who are saved because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. So the Bible says he's seen of Peter. Then he's seen of the other disciples. Then he's seen of 500 random people. No. 500 eyewitnesses from all walks of life. No, no, no. 500 brethren. He was seen of over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain under this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, probably referring to the brother of Jesus Christ there. Then of all the apostles, which are, you know, at least 70 others. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time, for I'm the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So notice, he's seen of 
the disciples. He's seen of above 500 brethren at once. He's seen of the apostles. And last of all, tell this to the guy who said, oh, Jesus appeared to me last week. Last of all, he was seen of me, Paul said. See, the next time he comes, every eye shall see him when he comes in the clouds. But the bottom line is that he did not show himself to unbelievers. Which unbeliever did he show himself to? You know, he's showing himself to people that, yeah, D Thomas was doubting, but he was still a saved believer. He'd been following Christ for years. He had believed on Christ. He was just experiencing doubt. But yet, the Bible clearly lines out a list of about 600 people who saw Christ after he rose from the dead. But notice they all have something in common. They all were saved. They all already believed in him. So why didn't he show himself to all the unsaved? Because the resurrection is a sign unto us which are saved. Because the only way to get saved is by believing. It's by faith. So if you saw it, then it wouldn't be as much faith required if you saw it. Now, obviously, people did see miracles of Jesus and still didn't believe on him. They still explained it away. But God wants us to have faith in him. And the resurrection as a sign was a sign unto us which are saved. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 40. It's very clear on this. The Bible says, Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, not to this Hollywood movie Roman guy, the investigator. <laughs> There's no reference to some investigator seeing him, some unbeliever. It says, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive Remission of sins. So whether you're reading the four Gospels, whether you're reading 1 Corinthians 15, whether you're reading here in Acts chapter 10, or even in Malachi, where we're going to turn next, the Bible's really clear that he was shown alive unto those who were believers. He was shown unto them. It was a sign unto them that believed. So the Jews require a sign. He said there's no sign that's going to be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And guess what? You're going to have to take the word for that Amen. of the Bible. <laughs> you can't, you're not even going to see it. None of you will see it. So did Jesus give them a sign in that sense? No. He said, no, the sign is the gospel. And guess how you're going to have to hear about the gospel from a believer preaching it to you. That's who's going to preach the resurrection. People who are believers, people who have faith. Just like I today, this morning, am preaching the resurrection of Christ. We go out door to door and uh, win people to Christ through what? Preaching of the cross. Preaching the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We don't go around performing miracles. We go around preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. But thirdly this. The resur and go to Malachi 4. This, this, this scripture kind of proves the second and the third point. The third point is this. The resurrection is good news unto us which are saved. So number one, the resurrection is the power of God unto us which are saved. Number two, the resurrection is a sign. It proves who Christ was unto us which are saved. Because you have to believe the word of God because none of us saw the resurrection. No unbelievers even saw it at that time. And number three, the resurrection is good news because the Bible equates the resurrection as the gospel. And what does the word gospel mean? The word gospel simply means good news. But the gospel is only good news unto us which are saved. Right. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, hey, this is only for an elite exclusive group because whosoever will may come. Yeah. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's available unto all. But it's only good news unto us which are saved. But you can be saved. Anyone can be saved if they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only requirement for salvation. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All we have to do is believe. 
and we'll be saved. It's that simple. Many people refuse to believe. Many people will never believe. Many people have a hardened heart that cannot believe any longer. But the gospel is available to anyone who wants to believe. It's the, it's, hey, Jesus died for everybody. He died for everybody. But listen to this in Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. This is the last chapter before the New Testament. It's a very fitting chapter to end on because at the end of the chapter, it prophesies the coming of John the Baptist, which is the next stage in uh, what... You know, it, it, let me just stop and just, and just throw something out there while I'm here. Isn't it amazing how the Old Testament points us to the New Testament so many times? He talks about how he's going to make a new covenant not according to the old covenant. You know, he prophesies that over and over again. There's a new covenant coming. A new testament's coming, right? And then he ends up, after just all these prophecies about John the Baptist, prophecies about Jesus, prophecies about a new testament, prophecies about the death, burial, and resurrection, he ends it up by giving us just a clear scripture talking about John the Baptist coming in Malachi chapter 4. And then we have the New Testament fulfilling all that. And then at the end of the New Testament, we're basically left with, I come quickly. You know, we're left with pretty much the next thing to expect is the events of the end times as far as Christ coming in the clouds. Every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him. You know, that's what it points us to is the second coming of Jesus Christ and all the events leading up to and surrounding that. But isn't it amazing how the Mormons, they have this other testament of Jesus Christ that's never mentioned in the New Testament. Like, nowhere in the New Testament says, hey, there's a third testament coming. Right. Right. Hey, before, whoa, before I do all that stuff in Revelation, I'm going to go preach to the Indians first. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing, isn't that, I mean, isn't that just ridiculous? Yeah. Anyway, that has nothing to do with the sermon. I just wanted to throw that out there. But I like this chapter, Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven... And we're not talking about summer in Phoenix coming, but that will burn like an oven too, just on a little bit lower of a heat though. And all the proud and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. So let me ask you something. Does that sound like a positive message? Does that sound like good news? I mean, the day's coming that's going to burn like an oven and you're going to be like stubble. You're going to be like kindling. You're going to be like dry grass that just... Does this sound like good news? But look what the next verse says. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. See, the resurrection is unto you that fear my name. Unto us which are saved. He says, unto you which fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. See, unto us which are saved, he arises with healing in his wings. And on Easter, we think about that because, you know, it's a, it's a holiday that signifies the resurrection of Christ. But honestly, this is something that we can think about every day. And, and here's why. Because every morning, what rises again every morning? Every single day, the sun rises. And you know what? The Bible likens that unto Jesus because it says, that the Son of Righteousness, notice it's S-U-N, S-U-N, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in His wings. Now here's the thing, people say, oh, you're a sun worshiper, but here's the thing, worshiping the sun would be pagan and foolish. Just as, what if, what if we took a lamb though? What if we took a literal lamb and started bowing down and worshiping it? Wouldn't that be wicked? You know, like they, they, certain nationalities where they'll bow down and worship animals, cows, whatever. You know, it'd be just as foolish if we were to bow down and worship a physical lion or to bow down and worship a physical animal of any kind. But yet Jesus is referred to as an ox, a calf. He is likened unto a lion. He's likened unto a lamb. He's likened unto the sun. He, there are all these illustrations of Christ. We, we don't worship those physical objects, but we worship Christ. Amen. And so Jesus Christ truly is the son of righteousness. Okay, so... You know, the sun rises every morning, which is a symbol of Jesus Christ rising again from the dead. And isn't it great to think about that every morning? His mercies are new every morning, the Bible says. Great is thy faithfulness. Every morning, 
Just as Christ was raised up from the dead to the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Every morning's a fresh start. Every morning we can think of how Christ rose from the dead and how we're in Christ and how the power of the resurrection is the same power that keeps us saved uh, by faith unto the, unto the end of time. And I mean, it's, it's great. It's such a great symbol. Amen. The sun coming up unto us which are saved. Unto those that are not saved, the sun rising is meaningless. It doesn't really mean anything to them. They don't really understand. In fact, to those that are not saved, Easter itself is meaningless, which is why basically they go around with chocolate bunnies and Easter eggs. They think that Easter is about a rabbit that lays eggs. Why? Because the resurrection is meaningless unto them. But yet there are all kinds of people today who don't even believe in Jesus celebrating Easter and they have nothing to celebrate. Because the resurrection of Christ is only good news to those that are saved. It's doom unto those that are not saved. Because the Bible says right here that the day's coming that's going to burn as an oven and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be as stubble. You know, there are people whose pride is hindering them from believing on Jesus. And there are people whose wickedness is hindering them from believing on Jesus. Now, it's not because they'd have to turn away from their wickedness, because you don't have to turn away from your sins to be saved, or else none of us would be saved. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of works, as any man should boast. But the reason why some people's wickedness hinders them from being saved is that the Bible says, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And the Bible says that everyone that doeth truth cometh to the light. That his deeds may be made manifest, they're wrought in God. But the Bible says, he that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light. It doesn't say lest he would have to turn his life around. It says, lest his deeds should be reproved. People don't like the light to be shined on them. They don't like their sin to be exposed. And the Bible does that. Because when we see God's word and his righteousness and his holiness, you know, we have to be humble enough to realize that we're in sin and admit that we're a sinner. And a lot of people just aren't willing to admit that they're a sinner. That's why the proud and them that do wickedly are in one breath. You know, because a lot of times people, they do wickedness and then they're too proud to admit, hey, I don't deserve to go to heaven. You know, I, I deserve to go to hell. I commit sin. I'm, I'm a wicked person. Uh, as, Paul, as Peter said to Jesus, you know, depart from me for I'm, I'm a sinful man. Now, sometimes people who have great wickedness are great candidates for salvation because of the fact that they realize how much they need Jesus. And that's why Jesus did have so many publicans and, and harlots and people like that being saved because they knew that they needed forgiveness for their sins. Whereas some that were self-righteous as the Pharisees and Sadducees felt that they didn't need any help. They, they, they were good, you know, through keeping the law, which is, of course, folly. But... The Bible says in, in Malachi 4.3, Ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. That doesn't sound like good news for them. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. <clears throat> Title of the sermon this morning is, Unto us which are saved. Unto us which are saved. And of course, this is not trying to be exclusive and elite because the invitation's open to all. You can join this group whenever you want of being saved. Right. You can be saved today. It's easy to be saved. Yep. Amen. But unto us which are saved, the resurrection is the power of God unto salvation. Unto us which are saved, the resurrection is a great sign. It's a great evidence. It's a great authentication unto us which are saved, because we have to believe the Bible telling us about it. If you don't believe it, then it's not a sign for you because you didn't see it. No one saw it who wasn't saved. And thirdly, the resurrection is good news unto us which are saved. Look at 2 Corinthians 2.14. Now thanks be unto God which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. So how does God make manifest, how does he expose people to his knowledge? 
How is God's word and God's knowledge and the truth of the gospel made manifest in every place? It's made manifest by us, the Bible says. That little phrase there, by us. He said, maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Now, savor is basically a taste or smell. And he says in verse number 15, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. So to God, we're a sweet savor of Christ, whether it be in them that are saved and in them that perish. But watch what it says. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death. And to the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? So the Bible's saying here that, you know, we are a savor of Christ unto people that is either a good taste in their mouth or a bad taste in their mouth. But notice what the Bible says. To God, it's just a sweet savor, whether it's in them that save or in them that are perishing. Or, I said that wrong. Whether it's in them that are saved or whether it's in them that perish, we're just a sweet savor all around because you know what? To us which are saved and to God himself, the Bible's always great. We like all of it. You know, we like all of it. We like every page of it. I do. Amen. Who loves the Bible today? Yeah, I love Amen. it. I love it. I love all of it. Amen. But to those that are not saved, it can leave a real bad taste in their mouth, the Bible says. It's like a savor of death unto them. It smells like death. It tastes like death. And that's why he that is righteous, the Bible says, is an abomination unto the wicked, you know, because it's just that savor of death. That's why a church that loves people and preaches the good news is labeled a hate group, right? You guys are so hateful. It's a hate group. You know, the Southern Poverty Law Center has labeled you a hate group. Okay, but here's the thing. To us, the Southern Poverty Law Center is a stinking saver of death unto us. Okay? Now, unto us which are saved, we love Bible preaching. Tastes good to me. Smells good to me. But to them, it's this, oh, this horrible, rotten place. But see, we think that you filthy pedophiles down at the Southern Poverty Law Center are disgusting. Amen. We think you're a bunch of wicked perverts down there. Yeah. We think that you hate God, so you're a hate group. Yeah. You hate Jesus. You hate Christianity. You hate everything which is clean and pure and right. You hate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. That's right. You reject him. And you're the sons of them that killed the prophets yep, yep. and killed Jesus. And so to us which are saved, the resurrection's good news. But you know what? It's only good news if you're saved. Because if you're not saved, it's bad news for you. If you're not saved, it would have been better for you if Jesus would have just stayed in the grave. So put away the chocolate bunnies. Put away the chocolate eggs. Put away the ham and, and, and potatoes and corn because you have nothing to celebrate today if you're not saved. All you're celebrating is your doom. Because when Jesus rose from the dead and conquered death and hell and arose victorious, he arose to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he will one day say, and bring those men, my citizens who hated me, and slay them before me. That's not a good day for you. It's a day that's going to burn like an oven. But unto us which are saved, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, and he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. Amen. What a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. Unto us which are saved. I'll close with where I started. One last verse, 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved... It's the power of God. Unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the glorious gospel. Thanks be unto you for your unspeakable gift. Amen. And Lord, thank you that we have something to celebrate. Not only today, we have something to celebrate every day of our life. We can eat ham and mashed potatoes whenever we want because honestly... Every day the sun comes up and, and glorifies your resurrection. 
And so, Lord, we thank you so much for what you've given us. But, Lord, I, I, I want to spend the rest of my life getting other people in on this, this glorious gift, Lord. And so help all of us, all of us to invite others and compel others to be a part of this group, us which are saved, Lord. Help, help by the, Lord, help us by the end of the day to have included more people in that group, Lord, through soul winning, through any friends or family that we talked to today, through the preaching of your word, Lord, through the door-to-door -door soul winning, Lord. Help many people today join the group known as us which are saved. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.